You're watching Encounter TV, featuring the evangelistic healing ministry of David Diga Hernandez. David is taking the saving and healing power of God to this generation and the nations of the world. A generation is being inspired. You'll encounter the Holy Spirit's presence, God's healing power, the truth of the Word, the love of Christ, and freedom through the miraculous. You're watching Encounter TV. Hello, David Diga Hernandez here, and you are watching Encounter TV. Today, I'm going to show you footage from the Philippine Islands. It'll be the second time we've gone out there. Uh, my friend Steven Moctezuma is going to join me on the program today Hello, just to everyone. help out with some of the hosting and some of the questions that yep. we're going to be taking a little bit later. Uh, today's format is going to be a little bit different than usual uh, because um, some things that happened with the footage from the Philippines, but it all worked out for the good. So we're going to show you a couple clips from the Philippines today, but then we're going to get into the question and answer segment. So what you're actually going to see right now is something that we call an encounter service. An encounter service is our ministry event that we take here in the States and internationally. And Steve Moctezuma actually leads the worship yep. on Encounter TV. And many of you who subscribe to our YouTube channel, all our YouTube uh, viewers know who Steve is because he also does some of the worship for our channel. But uh, tell us a little bit, just kind of like on a, a second perspective, I guess, being there at the encounter services, what is it like preparing for one? What is it like what God does at one? What do you witness there? Uh, yeah, so uh, preparing for an encounter service is uh, a lot of fun. At the same time, it's a lot of uh, hard work. Um, obviously, uh, prior to me doing worship, I used to do camera. I used to be you behind the camera. Oh, yeah, you were actually one of the first I encounter to, TV camera guys. I used to be. If you if you look on YouTube at Diga's old stuff, you'll, Don't see, look me. At the old you'll stuff. see me back there with my camera. So I, I did kind of the shots there. Um, but, yeah, so before that, um, obviously, I did camera before. And uh, just being behind the camera while miracles are happening is kind of unreal. Like, it really is. Being it's, at the services, is there like a miracle? As And I'm glad you're here because you kind of serve as a, a third party here mm -hmm. for someone who hasn't been in one. And if I'm just saying, oh, <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't sound necessarily good. Yeah. But um, but what's one of the miracles you've witnessed at an encounter service that kind of stuck out to you? Um, one of the ones that really, I mean, obviously when I was actually behind the camera when this happened, and uh, it was uh, a woman that had uh, that was deaf in, I believe, her left or, or her right ear, and uh, it, it almost seemed as the faith was just building in the room. It really was. People were excited. People wanted to see this miracle. And uh, we were just filming it, and I was expecting it. And in my heart, I was like, "All right, this is this is better. I better get this shot because if I don't get it, you know, I would be I would be furious. He would be furious." And uh, so, um, you know, just filming it, it was almost like I was literally watching it myself, although I was behind the camera. And, and so, uh, Diga here, he just started begin to pray, and he began to just snap. And, uh, and one of the cool things that if you guys haven't seen him do is what he does is to kind of test this out and to build the faith as well because it's something crazy. Uh, he'll literally, uh, he'll say, can you hear me? And he'll walk back a few steps and say, can you hear me? And he'll keep going, can you hear me? Can you hear me? And, um, you know, the, and they would, their, their eyes would be closed and they would literally just be hearing with their ear. And when she got healed, she got healed like crazy. You could literally see. Oh, yeah, you could see the moment. And you could see the moment she got healed because she started see, worshiping. Yeah, she literally lifted her hands and everyone just went, whoa, like everyone screamed. And I got teared up. I really did. I was a little emotional because, you know, being behind the camera and filming these things, you know, it's just like, whoa, like you can feel the presence of God, you know right right where you were you know even me filming it you know yeah. and i felt heavy too it really and, that, and that's something that's interesting and one of the other reasons i brought you on is because i think it's good for people to see that there are other young people in ministry yes. besides me i mean and often we think there are certain types of ministries that young people do you know oh, i'll do the sound or i'll do the camera i'll do the media but i really do believe that that god wants to raise young people to worship to preach yes. to pray for the sick to prophesy and that's kind of been my heart and that's why i'm so glad you're here today because um, you do some of the worship for the yeah. encounter services mm -hmm. and what's that like to worship at just the, I mean talk about the presence of God so there. yeah so I mean doing worship and leading the worship obviously um, I've, I've been in worship quite some time since I was very young I've grown up in church with Dig here and so I uh, I found just a love for worship and then uh, through his ministry I was able to really express that and so one of the last uh, encounter services and miracle services that I was at I was able to fully lead the worship and just to bring the presence of God in that place was just uh, something that I, that's very it's very different from leading worship at a church just because I felt I was able to just really really flow like I've never really flowed before 
And obviously I had my team backing me up. And uh, again, it was just leading worship in that setting. You're setting yourself up just to see God, to just to see God hit you like crazy, you know, because it, it what do you mean by that? God hit you like crazy. Like, I mean, I'm young, so I use crazy terms, you know, but <laughs> but just the presence of God, like just even during our sound check, I was like, oh, man, this is going to be a great night. And a lot of people talk about that as they're pulling up to the building, they can feel yeah. the presence. So I want to just encourage you. You're watching this. He's going to be with me for the rest of the program, too. Uh, he's going to be, uh, we're going to do a very special moment of truth segment where it's going to be kind of several questions. I want you to want to stick around for that. There's some miracles I want to show you from the Philippines. The power of God moved there. Many people received the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You're going to want to see that too. Uh, so Steve wasn't necessarily with me at this particular service, but he'll be here with me on set uh, for the remainder of the program. So by the way, uh, nobody else can call me Dig. That's just, <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, let's go now to the Philippine Islands and see the power of God at work. Today on Encounter TV, you will see what God did during those miracle services in the Philippine Islands. Many heard the gospel of salvation, received the healing touch of God, and experienced the manifested presence of the Holy Spirit. Here, David is preaching a message when he receives a word of knowledge. In the middle of his ministry, David stopped and asked to pray for the wife of Pastor Sammy Moores, a great spiritual leader in the Philippine Islands. Unknown to David, Pastor Sammy's wife, Naomi, was at that very moment having an episode of vertigo. Is she coming or not? We don't want to pressure her, but I believe that what's going Are you sure? Okay, and then we gotta get a chair for her, okay guys? Her episode of vertigo was so bad, Naomi struggled to even leave the back room and approach the platform. The people waited in anticipation for her. Unable to walk or even stand on her own, Naomi was escorted to the platform and seated for prayer. Sister Naomi, this is spiritual. This is what happened next. Father, in the name of Jesus, we speak the healing power of God. I rebuke every word and the mouth that was raised against this woman. Say it again. Also, the presence of the Holy Spirit began to manifest in an intensely powerful way. As the people worshipped, the heart of God was touched and His presence, like a gentle breeze, began to move about the room. David received a word of knowledge regarding the healing of deafness. Soon, someone who was healed of his deafness approached the platform. And then another. And then another. Almost one year, 
And Jesus deserves all of the glory, all of the credit for what took place there in the Philippine Islands. I believe that he still heals the sick to this day through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's funny, you were just talking about seeing that deaf lady healed at the yeah. encounter service. And so to see it here now in the Philippine it, it Islands. Never, it never gets old to see that stuff, it really doesn't. And I, I, that's so true. And so this is one of my challenges to people. And again, I'm emphasizing here, um, you know, you see other people doing what God has called them to do, and it inspires you. You see me preaching and prophesying and praying for the sick. You see here Steve here on the program with me. He does the worship for the encounter services. You hear him talking about the things he's experienced at those events. But now here, we're going to show you a clip because it's time for our Mark 16 miracle segment. And this is where we take footage from you, our viewer, of you praying for the sick, prophesying, evangelizing. And so in this clip, uh, you're going to see the power of God moving through the hands of somebody who stepped outside the four walls of the church. Watch this. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Please. In Jesus name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing right now, Lord. Thank you. Bless what you're doing, Lord. We bless what you're doing right now. Bless what you're doing, Lord. Oh yeah, we bless what you're doing, Lord. Yeah. It's 500 times more movement than he's had. We speak on every joint. And God can do the same with you. Here is my challenge to you now, the viewer. I want you to step outside the four walls of the church, evangelize, prophesy, pray for the sick, capture it on footage, send it into us, and we may feature it here on the Mark 16 Miracle segment on Encounter TV. For more information on how you can get your footage to us, stick around until the end of the program. We're going to give you some general contact information. But for now, let's go back to the Philippine Islands. What you're about to see our youth and young adults receiving the infilling of the Holy Spirit. This is really going to bless you. And I believe as you watch this, that the power and presence of God is going to touch your life as well. Let's go now to the Philippine Islands.
Well, I pray that you were blessed by seeing that footage from those youth and young adults receiving the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And I really do pray that as that, that video was, was, was showing that you were receiving an impartation as well. And I don't want you to go anywhere because at the end of this program, I'm going to pray that the same presence, power that came on those youth and young adults in the Philippine Islands would come on you right as you're watching this. But first now, it's time for our Moment of Truth segment. This is where I take your questions and do my very best to present a biblical answer to them. But as I stated at the top of the program, today's format is just a little bit different than we're used to doing it. Uh, so what we're actually going to do is we're going to take several questions in our Moment of Truth segment. And that is why Stephen Moctezuma is here with yes, us today. Yes, yes, yes. So you got some questions in there from the viewers. Yes, and I do. I'm ready for them whenever you are. All right. So uh, first questions come from Daniel uh, from Indianapolis. He wrote, uh, what do you think about Christian people getting tattoos? Is it a sin or not? Okay, so that's a two-part question. So he wants to know, two part. What, is it, what do we think about Christians who want to get tattoos? And is it a, is sin, it a sin? Okay, I have... I know I have a note here on that somewhere in my, I, I keep a lot of my notes organized, but Leviticus 19.28 is the only reference that specifically mentions tattoos in the entire Bible. Now, admittedly, that is a scripture that is found in the Old Testament, the Levitical law. And so we funnel the Old Testament law through all of the new things that are accomplished in the Old Testament, so di or in the New Testament. So dietary restrictions, um, sacrificial uh, protocol, uh, feasts, and events such as that um, are not necessarily applicable to our lives today. So if we're going to come at it biblically, even though I personally don't like tattoos, I have to admit that the Bible does not teach that it is a sin. But I do have this scripture for anyone who wants to get a tattoo to consider, and it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 23. And the scripture says this, You say, I am allowed to do anything. But not everything is good for you. You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. Now, again, we have to admit that, that getting a tattoo is not a sin. But I really do believe that if one is to get it, they have to be wise in their approach to it. Now, I personally would never get one. I don't recommend anyone ever get them. It's a, it's a permanent decision and it can't be undone and often it's done in younger years so you're having a young guy make a permanent decision for an older guy and so i personally i don't like them personally i don't recommend them and i think biblically we see grounds to question such behavior mm. but biblically speaking it is not a sin awesome jose asks why didn't jesus ever speak in tongues okay well i'm, I'm gonna make an assumption here with jose's question um and i think that jose's assumption is that that if Jesus didn't speak in tongues, neither should we. Now, again, I don't know, Jose. I don't know the context. Where is that question from? That is actually from a uh, YouTube. Okay, so it's a YouTube comment. So it's probably like in, in, in within, the, within a debate somewhere on YouTube, maybe on a, a video on speaking in tongues. So I'm going to assume, and Jose, forgive me if I'm incorrect for assuming this, but some people will ask that question. And again, I'm making a big assumption here. And I think he's asking that because he's using it with an assumption behind the question to try to assert that because Jesus didn't speak in tongues, therefore we should not. But uh, Mark chapter 16 um, in the scripture here, and I know this, this particular verse because it's actually the theme verse for our segment, the Mark 16 miracle segment, which has to do with Jesus empowering those who hear the gospel message. Uh, Mark chapter 16, we'll start at verse 16. Jesus talking here, anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Verse 17, these miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name, and they will speak with new tongues. And I believe that that empowering comes upon the church. We don't see it come upon the church actually until Acts chapter 2, when those who were faithfully gathered in prayer receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. So there are, there are a lot of things that we do uh, that, that Jesus didn't do. Uh, we repent of our sins. Jesus never repented of his sins. Um, we, we, we pastor churches. Jesus didn't necessarily pastor a church. Uh, we, we serve in a local church. Jesus didn't necessarily serve in a local church. Uh, we study the Bible. There was no Bible when Jesus was around. So I, I think that not necessarily, we can't necessarily discount the gift of tongues just because Jesus never spoke in tongues, but in fact, he himself endorsed it. So um, did Jesus speak in tongues? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say whether he did or not. It doesn't say he didn't, but it also doesn't say he did. So at best, we're left with leaving it without the assumption of either way, saying that he did or did not speak in tongues. 
When it comes down to it, he did in fact endorse it. And then the writings of Paul the Apostle uh, established the gift and as a gift for the early church. And we see the early church receive it in Acts chapter 2. So why didn't Jesus speak in tongues? Well, we don't know that he didn't. And if he didn't, it's a non sequitur. It doesn't matter because the Bible later does establish that gift as something that's biblical. All right. And the next question here is from George. Uh, he asks, how important is it being a part of a local church to grow in Christ? Well, it's very important. And, and one of my concerns for this generation right now, Steve, is that we have somewhat of an anti-establishment mentality. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is we want to rebel. We don't like the idea of structure. I mean, you, you, you talk about the wealthy and automatically in our minds, we view them as the bad guy. You talk mm -hmm. about the politicians, automatically in our minds, we view them as the bad guy. And in many parts of the world, sadly, police officers, they're looked at as the bad guys. So I think this question is important to answer, and I believe it's Hebrews 10, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, where that we can actually see um, there's an emphasis placed on going to church. So Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 25 says this in the New Living Translation, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So it's very important. A lot of a lot of times we want to deny that there's a structure, but God is a God of order. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order. Ephesians 4.11 talks about how God gave us the prophets, the apostles, the pastors, the evangelists, the teachers, and he gives us these gifts because he is establishing an order to the church. And so we like to say that the church is not a structure. We like to declare that the church is not a building. And to some degree, that is true. I am the church. You are the church. We are part of the church. But in another sense, the scripture also does allude to the church being this systemized structure that God has placed on earth to establish the kingdom. And really, you cannot accomplish a goal in unity and put in effect everyone's ability behind one common purpose without organization, mm. which is why the Bible says Jesus Christ is the head of the church, which right there we see an establishment of a somewhat of a ranking, not of importance, but of a ranking. The scripture talks about spiritual leaders who, who give an account for our souls. I have a pastor who I'm submitted to as an evangelist in a local church. All legitimate ministries are, are, are tied to the local church. So it's very important. And I want to caution against the danger of this anti-establishment mentality that's really, uh, especially affecting millennials, which, which would affect that. That's going to be you and I. Uh, so I really want to... Um, I wanted to hit that head on. And so we have to understand, yes, there's a structure. Yes, there's a system. Yes, there's a building. Yes, there's a meeting. Yes, there is ranking. And yes, there is ecclesiastical authority. And mm -hmm. we have to obey our spiritual authorities. We have to attend church if we want to fulfill our fullest spiritual potential. Mm -hmm. We need to be in a church, period. And there's no getting wow. around that. Awesome. All right. And uh, next question comes from Bill. And he asked, what, other, what about other religions? How do you know that we are right? Why can't we be more accepting of others? So that's three that's questions. That's three questions. Okay, let's take it one at a time. And this is from who? This is from Bill. And this okay, is an email. Bill, email mm -hmm. from an email, okay. And he asked, what about other religions? What about other religions? Well, that's my question. What about them? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, mean I, 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 I get it. I understand it. Um, but we have to understand that really, um, as worldviews go, Categorically speaking, there's only three. And there are those who believe in materialism. Just the universe exists. Just what we can see, what we can handle exists. And those who believe, then there are those who believe on the extreme, spiritualism. They believe that only God exists, that the universe is not really real. It's a construct of consciousness. It's like a dream or it's not actual reality that this is a projection of some kind from a spiritual realm. Mm. And then there's the one in the middle that says both the spiritual and the material coexist within different dimensions from one another. So categorically speaking, we can eliminate those right off the bat. We can eliminate spiritualism because of what cosmology tells us. Not cosmetology, cosmology, <laughs> study of space, time. Um, we can eliminate spiritualism. We know the material world exists. I mean, as far as, you know, some people want to get into debate on what is reality. It's a whole different question for another time. Then there is, there are those who believe just materialism. These are atheists, agnostics, skeptics. Uh, we know that it's not true from things like objective moral values. This is not to say that you need to believe in God to be good. This is simply to say that we all 
believe in the existence of objective moral values, and that objectivity has to be grounded in something that exceeds our own ability to, to, to ground it. Otherwise, it is by definition subjective. And then there's the third, which is both the spiritual and the material exist, and that's what the Bible says. In fact, it says it in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God. So in that small line of beliefs, we have Islam, we have Judaism, we have Christianity, and maybe a few others who fit it. I don't know of any others who actually do. Out of those, um, I believe that what the, the testimony, the historical evidence of what Jesus' resurrection, his teachings, who he proved himself to be, I believe that doesn't necessarily do away with Judaism because it's, you know, it's, it's Judeo-Christian faith. So I believe it ties it all together and it, it, it completes it. So I think Judaism is just incomplete Christianity. Hmm. So then you have Islam, but then you get things that they say like that Jesus was never crucified and, and things like that. Just such wild historical inaccuracies that they're historically inaccurate. So, so that's how I take it and I, I funnel it down very quickly. But one of the things I try to tell people is the fact that everyone can be wrong, but not everyone can be right. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So either Jesus is the only way or he's not the way at all. And so I don't think you have to go through and stick your head in every single one of these situations and go, well, I believe in this and I, I discovered that. I don't think we have to do that. I don't think we have to prove every other religion to be false. Mm -hmm. Not that I count Christianity as a religion. We simply have to show that Christ is the way. And if you can show that Christ is the way, whether through your personal testimony or whether through the historical evidence that supports the, the truth of his resurrection, then he, by default, because of his exclusive claim to truth, proves all others to be false. Mm. And that is wow. our time for the moment of truth. And thank you for being with me here, Steve. I know it was a little bit different, so I'm glad you're here to help us through with that and in this new format. And this isn't a permanent format. This is just for this episode, like I said, with some footage from the Philippines that I just decided um, we would show later and I wanted to save it. So this episode, we featured those two clips, but we're gonna close it up now. I pray that God would bless you and use you. Steve, thanks for joining me, my hey, friend. No Hopefully you ca help come uh, co-host a couple yeah. other. All right, cool. So um, thank you so much for watching. That's it for this edition of Encounter TV. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. If you've enjoyed the program and would like more information about connecting with this ministry, visit EncounterTV.com. You can submit your questions for our Moment of Truth segment, as well as your Mark 16 miracle video of you on the streets praying for the sick, prophesying, and releasing the kingdom of God. You can also download our free app by searching David Diga Hernandez in the Apple or Google Store.